Hello and welcome back to another episode of the For the Property Investor podcast. And of course, we have Nick Bendel with us again for the weekly news segment. Welcome, Nick. Thank you so much for having me, Owen. Great to see you again. Yes, and um, great to, to have you back with us as well, as always we do. So, um, and, and um, how has your week been this week? Well, I, I've had a really, really good week. Thank you for asking. My business, Hunter and Scribe, is a copywriting agency that writes content for finance and property professionals throughout Australia. We work with buyers, agents, non-bank lenders, accountants, financial advisors, builders, conveyances, real estate agents. We also work with a lot of mortgage brokers. And over the past week, we've helped our mortgage broker clients with everything from blogs and social media posts to email newsletters and media releases. Fantastic. And you mentioned some of the favourite people that we work with as well. Um, at Leafield, we're a national property management business and we love working with mortgage brokers, but um, uh, as well as buyer's agents and sales agents where we're a 100% outsource solution for them to be able to uh, build a property management um, uh, business for themselves. So, um, yeah, that's what we're all about if um, you're listening for the first time. I have mentioned your amazing outsource solution to quite a few people I know. I, I think it's such a fantastic offering because building a rent roll is something tangible you can sell in, in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, when you, when you want to exit the industry. It really is a great way to build long-term wealth. Yeah, it, it is. It is because um, if you're a, a transactional um uh, in a transactional position in this industry, either as a buyer's agent or a sales agent, then you know you're only as good as your last transaction. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of your career, um, at the end of your business, um, you're um, you're left with um, your last transaction. So um, this way, um, as um, you can actually build and own an asset that is saleable at the end. Well, Owen, usually with these podcasts, we have a chat about three news stories. We're actually recording this podcast several weeks in advance to cover for a family holiday that you're taking. So rather yes. than discussing uh, three recent news stories, as we usually do, I thought we might have an in-depth discussion about housing affordability. How does that sound? That, that sounds amazing, Nick, and uh, because at, at this point in time, I'll be uh, most likely in, in the depths of a cold winter in um, somewhere very cold, and I would be too cold to try and get on and talk about the news. <laughs> well, I, I hope you're wearing uh, thermal underwear right now. <laughs> I, I, I hope so, too. For your sake. Yes, for my sake. <laughs> so so what are we talking about? The Senate Standing Committee's on Economics has been conducting an inquiry into home ownership and Australia's financial regulatory framework. The inquiry has received submissions from numerous parties, including a conservative think tank called IPA, or the Institute of Public Affairs. IPA made three recommendations to improve housing affordability and home ownership rates. So I want, let's examine these one by one. The first of the three recommendations is that immigration should be reduced. Unprecedented immigration is compounding record high housing and rental prices by increasing demand, IPA said. The federal government should immediately review its immigration policy and adjust the number of arrivals to levels commensurate with housing supply to ensure Australians already here can purchase their own homes. Owen, is IPA right to say the number of people we allow into the country should correspond with the number of homes we build each year? Um, it shouldn't be the only factor. I mean, we do, there are so many other factors that would... Um that would add to that um you know not the number one 
is uh, on that list would be yeah labor force requirements and because if we need more skilled um uh, skilled um uh, workers in the workforce then uh, the quickest way of being able to get them is by through immigration. So, um, yes, I think we definitely need to have a decrease in the amount of immigration while we've got these issues. And and so the focus on immigration needs to be on, on people that uh, can help us with that problem. And um, Otherwise, they need to be able to prove that they won't put a burden on their on the housing system once they are here. Mm, it, it's interesting because, of course, every new person who enters the country needs to be housed. Uh, if though people coming into the country are in the construction industry or tradies, I suppose they could help increase the rate of. Uh, of residential construction going on and so they could actually make a net contribution to the problem yes um correct but um yeah it's the chicken or the egg problem mm. yeah it's um you need to be doing both at the same time well so, so you made the point that immigration uh, level should be assessed based on a range of factors. But I, I'm wondering, is IPA's theory correct, which is if, if the level of immigration was to be reduced, would that uh, therefore reduce demand for housing and therefore uh, put downward pressure on prices and rents? Uh, it would certainly help um, because, yes, the less immigration, in the 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 less people, the less demand, and that would have a positive effect on bringing uh, prices down for both rents as well as for buying. The second recommendation from IPA is that first home buyers should be able to tap into their super. So let me quote from IPA: First time home buyers who are struggling to afford the deposit to purchase a home should be allowed to draw from their compulsory superannuation their own income to help purchase their own home. In addition, Australians who are homeowners should be able to use their superannuation to pay down their mortgage, especially given rising interest rates and current inflationary pressures. This is important because those who retire without owning their own home are significantly disadvantaged compared to those who do. With, re with retirement income having to cover rents and without the option of drawing additional income from their home asset. Owen, should first home buyers be allowed to use their super to fund their deposit as IPA is suggesting? Hmm, I'm not a big fan of this uh, idea. It's because your super is there for a reason, which is to um, build wealth for your future um, as, as an investment vehicle. So uh, buying your own house um, to live in is not an investment. If anything, it's a liability. And so, um, yes, you can make money from capital growth. And yes, it's not taxed, so you get a benefit there. Um, but if you've got a third-party entity, which essentially your superannuation is, um, investing in your owner-occupied home, then you would need to be paying rent um, to your superannuation. Um, and you would also then need to, when you sell the property, uh, pay back your super fund um, with any, any applicable capital growth that you've received as well. The other potential issue to think about is that if we are going to allow first-time buyers to tap into their super, it's going to add demand, increase demand without increasing supply. And it seems like that would uh, make the problem worse rather than better. Yeah, that's that's the other problem as well. So um, all you're doing is, is effectively giving them free money, which means they can go and um, spend more. So um, because that's how generally people work.
Hmm. So it sounds like IPA, the think tank, needs to do a bit more thinking on this issue. Yes, I would think so. <laughs> uh, well, um, I would recommend, yes. Now, they, they also raise the idea of existing owners being allowed to use their super to pay off their mortgage. What do you think of that idea? Um, how does that help their super funds? Hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's uh, again, I, I think it's um, a, a short-term fix. Um, yeah, it, it's, it, it, yeah, interest rates are, uh, have been increased are increased for a reason. Um, and if you're going to take away the the positive effects that higher interest rates are trying to achieve, um, and if you if you give people a way of being able to cheat and get away without it, um, then it's not going to uh, then we're going to be stuck with longer interest rates for longer. Hmm. Interestingly, IPA one of the reasons they gave for saying that homeowners should be allowed to use their super to pay off their mortgage is that uh, if you get to retirement and you don't own your own home, uh, people in that situation have worse outcomes than people who do own their own home. But I, I guess if you weren't allowed to take out that super and it was to compound for 30 years, once you retired, if you still had uh, an outstanding home loan, couldn't you just take money from your super then and use it to pay down your mortgage? Exactly. So uh, have a super fund that's working well and growing well and so that you can pay off your mortgage when you retire. You're exactly perfectly correct, Nick. Um, and, and, and in respect of being able to use your super, um, your super to be able to buy a property, you can already do that, but it just needs to be an investment property. So, and the the positive effects of buying a property in your super fund could well be, and I'm not providing financial advice here, um, it could well be much more beneficial than taking the cash out and just put it into your home loan. So again, uh, uh, you think the think tank needs to do some more thinking? Yeah, they need to know what they're um, talking about first, it sounds like. Okay, well, let's move on to the third recommendation. I'll be curious to know what you think of this one. Foreign investor restrictions should be strengthened. Quote, the principal position of the federal government should be that Australians have the opportunity to purchase a home and achieve the Australian dream of owning their home without competing with international investors. Whilst the number of dwellings being purchased annually by international investors is down on what it has been in the past, the shortage of new dwellings built since the pandemic has seen an increase in the number of established dwellings being bought by international investors, even as the total number of residential dwellings being bought have stagnated. Rather than largely purchasing new housing, international investors are increasingly diluting the amount of available housing that already exists, and this is reflected in the decreasing proportion of newly built housing being purchased by international investors. Owen, my follow-up question to you is, should foreign buyers be limited to buying new properties only? Uh, I think yes. It's Okay. And why is that? It's... Um, if um, a lot of foreign investors... Uh, to be able to well, firstly they're they're putting capital into the into um, into the country's economy, and quite often they're willing to buy properties that Americans don't want to buy, um, and don't have aspirations to buy, but they might need to live in them uh, as a renter um, to be able to do what they need to do in terms of work where they need to work. Um, maybe while they're saving up for, to, to buy a property. So foreign investors being able to buy new properties um, add a lot of value to the Australian economy and to the Australian housing market. And um, as well as that being invested in new builds. So while they might be limited to only maybe 20% or 40% within a, 
a new building of apartments and, or units. Um, without that 20 or 40 percent injection from 40 from uh, foreign investors in just that building then that building wouldn't get built mm. so we've got the rest of the building that would be sitting there without any supply so it it does uh, provide a lot now when you look at it in terms of the whole market in terms of how much foreign investors are buying up each year it's minuscule so it can be very concentrated in particular brand new buildings and and then over time uh, those investors will uh, do sell the properties they get bought up by locals so um, that um, percentage starts to get diluted so um, because quite often they might be selling and then rebuilt and then reinvesting into uh, new developments that are uh, that have been um, um, uh, started for uh, building more supply in the marketplace. So, yes, I think uh, foreign buyers being limited to buying new properties only is is um, adds a lot of value to the Australian economy and housing market. Okay, well, let me throw two different scenarios at you. What about allowing temporary residents to purchase established homes provided they sell those homes when they leave the country? Should that be permitted? Um, it depends on how temporary, you know, um, it's um, so uh, yeah, probably a more complicated um, um, a question um, in terms of yeah, it depends on what visa they have. Are they here just for a, a six month holiday? Um, and because there'd be no real point in them buying for a six month period um, if they're um, um, here on a working visa. Um, and yeah, if they have permanent residency, uh, then they, they can already buy. Um, but if they're here on a some kind of temporary working visa, depending on how long that that visa is. Um, so yeah, it's um, uh, I'm uh, yeah, I would need more information for for to answer that one specifically. Yeah. Okay. Well, what about a different idea that I'm going to throw at, throw at you? What about the idea that foreigners should not be allowed to buy any properties, whether new or established? Well, coming back to the um, the first point that you asked, um, you know, there's there's so much positives to um, foreign investors being able to to um, uh, buy brand new properties. That um, yeah, we we would be at a um, a disadvantage by by banning foreigners from from buying any um, any property at all in in Australia. So I definitely think there needs to be um, yeah I have more of an issue with them buying up in, uh, infrastructure and farming and and all of those things and um, uh, rather than um, than than brand new houses uh, or apartments. Um, so yeah. We've been talking about one think tank's recommendations to improve housing affordability. What, if you were prime minister, if you were dictator, what would you do to improve affordability? Housing affordability? Mm. Um, yeah, in, in, in the short term, we need to take as much demand out of uh, the equation as possible. So, um, take away all of the um, the grants and stamp duty relief and um, uh, and then we would need to um, work on the supply issue um, and which we've already spoken about from a um, yeah immigration uh, point of view before we need um, more more labor supply in the country of trades to be able to build more properties, build more houses, and um, and get more supply into the market, so and and get them built quicker as well. 
Um, but then long term, um, it's uh, property tax reform, and and that comes in, that's a combination of stamp duty as well as land tax. Um, so reforming how um, they are implemented and taxed. So we've got maybe a, a, a broader based land tax and with lower stamp duty because stamp duty is a dumb, stupid tax um, that's just this gatekeeper on on stopping people being able to 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 buy the type of property they they need. And it also um, uh, is a deterrent to um, older people who are empty nesters living in a big house um, who should really be downsizing to something smaller and more manageable. Um, but because of the stamp duty costs, it, it makes it uneconomical for them. If you were Prime Minister and you implemented all these policies, do you think you'd be re-elected? <laughs> uh, well, I might not necessarily be um, popular to start off with, um, yeah, but um, most great things um, aren't, um, aren't done by people who are popular. Hmm. Well... That's why in this hypothetical scenario, I made you a dictator. Uh, okay. I thought you might struggle to get re-elected. So the good news is you never have to face another election again. Phew. Well, you know, it's, um, as they say, the, the, the worst um, uh, political system in the world is democracy, except for all of the others. <laughs> Well, on that note, Prime Minister, thank you for the chat and I'll see you next week. Thank you very much, Nick. And um, yes, looking forward to our next chat. See ya.